Let us pray. Gracious God, give us the heart and the mind and the spirit to seek your spirit, to welcome you to live in our, in our lives as we may dwell in yours, that we may always see that we, we are called to be your servants, to be embraced by you, and to love one another. Amen. Please be seated. Questions. Lots of questions. But there's this thing about questions that really do make us think. It's in those classes where we are asked over and over different things that pull up from us things we never would have expected that we were thinking or feeling, helping to define and shape, but open our minds. John's Gospel is filled with questions, and so is particularly chapter 6, the Bread of Life Discourse. And since we're in week 6, we are all fairly familiar with the beginning of the discourses and the, the theme of Jesus, the living bread that offers his flesh and his own blood and sacrifice for this world. And the questions begin with when he first sees Philip following him, if not following him, with the, the 5,000 of the crowd that have followed. And he says, where, Philip, he says to Philip, where are we to bribe bread for all these people to eat? For the people who are seeking Jesus for leftover bread, Rabbi, when did you come here? And the people who ask, what must we do to perform the works of God? Or is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say that he has come down from heaven? And how can this man give, him, give us his flesh to eat? This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? Questions. There are 14 questions in our reading today that tell us we are asked to probe, we're to go beyond the written word, we're to look to see what it is and go to the depths to see what Jesus is saying to us. And it says, Jesus to the crowd, does this offend you? And what if you were to see me return from where I came? Would that make a difference? And finally, that question to the 12 disciples, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter Lord, to whom would we go? And Jesus, did I not choose you, the twelve? Some are easy questions. They're all important. Questions ask us to give our responses from where we are right now and what we know or what we know we don't know and to engage and to discover what might be a larger, more imaginable response. So we might ask, why were the crowds following Jesus in the first place? So many of them. Many of the disciples were following Jesus because they saw what he was doing in the signs with the sick, healing them. After, he would, the, after they had eaten, the 5,000 had eaten on the, the mountain, they tried to make him a king, and they searched for him to to not just to make him king, but for the leftovers that were, that were from the feeding of the 5,000. Why did Jesus use this, since this, the metaphor is this, uh, this way of saying that I am the bread of life, I am light, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am living water, I am the living bread. And what does that comparison, these different comparisons, make us think of? Maybe they provide a, a direct uh, correlation to a passage in our Hebrew scriptures, the good shepherds and the false shepherds. Or maybe it's about plumbing our depths to come to different images that apply of what is our experience with living water when we've really seen it, and what does that mean in terms of our lives? But to think to think beyond what are the standard images, the things we have become used to, so that we may break through walls 
and that we may see beyond. It is today in our reading that we eat his, my flesh and drink his blood. Does that ask me to think that actually, or perhaps maybe it's a theological statement as about the Eucharist, or as sustenance, something that we can actually chew on, the word being actually gnaw, like on a bone but on his flesh, to gnaw, to ingest, to fully try to take into our heart and soul. Pondering about other possibilities is the challenge. So learning from Jesus is not necessarily a pre-digested dogma, but an invitation, and with Jesus always an invitation, to mystery, to the unknown, but seemingly familiar, and to wonder and delight. Yet the most stirring question is the one Jesus asked the twelve. Do you also wish to go away? Do we also wish to go away at times? Simon, Peter, to whom can we go? And you have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This confession of Simon Peter touches our hearts. It resonates even with the possibility of despair that if one could not be with Jesus, where would we go? And ask us to join in saying, yes, we are with you, Lord, because we have heard your words of spirit and life also. We know that what we have heard is real, that it is life-giving, that is where I must be, not ought, but where I must be to stay and to stay connected, to be fully alive. You have the words of eternal life. And we hear in the confession that deep sorrow that Simon Peter expresses if he had to look for another. We know that experience. We've had it when we've had favorite teachers who looked at us and saw something that no other teacher saw. And we would study the course material, but there was a relationship that was not going to be present once we left that class and had other teachers. Or of a friend that's the bestie. It's the best friend we've ever had. We could talk all night. We giggled. We had fun. And then their family moved away. And after a few phone calls and some birthday cards, things changed, and no one even our image of that friend could ever fill that space again. Peter has said, we have come to believe and know who you are, what you do and what you say. It is God who is there present with us. You are in God and God is in you, Jesus. That we know. And from the first invitation that Jesus offered to the disciples who were following him, when John the Baptist points out, there goes the Lamb of God, Jesus says to them, what are you seeking? And they say, where are you staying? Where are you abiding? They could have said, in whom are you abiding? And his response, an invitation, come and see, come and see. And at that sign in Cana, can't they be just so amazed at what they see as wine overflowing, abundance, something different about this particular wedding, about being with Christ and enjoying it. But then again in the temple in Jerusalem, they go early in the Gospel of John, and they see Jesus encounter the money changers and the merchants, and echoing what they hear in their heart from the Psalm 69, verse 9, zeal for your house will consume me. And all the signs that he did, the people believed him because God was in their midst in integrity, in love, and who he was calling us to be. And the disciples could not forget that Samaritan woman, the one to whom Jesus spoke at the well, and how she brought an entire town to hear him, and they all believed. It was like, what could happen in this world when you're traveling with Jesus? The amazement, the unexpected, the response. It is similar to what C.S. Lewis said. 
We trust not because a God exists, but because this God exists. Jesus' question, do you also wish to go away, calls us to examine if we are indeed abiding with Christ, with this Christ. Do we make frequent visits, but live somewhere else? Bob and Tracy owned a home together in Philadelphia. Both were physicians. Tracy worked in a local hospital, but her, her husband took a job in the emer- under an emergency room contract, which took her, him all over the United States. And they tried. They really did. But despite their best efforts, it wasn't working. They really were not abiding with each other. Nor how can we abide if Jesus is not in our schedule? What are our intentional contact times? Regular church attendance and participation in the life of the community? Yes. Church and beyond? Yes. You, Lord, have the words of eternal life. Where I can abide is in your love. Seeing uh, seeing you and all other persons and places in where you abide also strengthens me. Do I engage in meaningful study of the scriptures? Do I listen? Do I open myself to other questions? Jeffrey attended a class on parables. He expected what most of us do is to understand exactly what those silly stories are saying. What is the one interpretation? But when he got there, he found out that it called him to different interpretations, to asking questions he never really would have thought about. And when they studied the parable of the Good Shepherd, it wasn't so much, it wasn't so much that why he went looking for the lamb, but how did he even know he was missing? The question might be, who do we see who's missing in our community? Who is missing from our community? What are questions we are called to ask? Abiding is also persevering, and there's no one better than Paul who suffered immensely to spread and proclaim the gospel of Christ. Ephesians encourages us to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power because he knew, he knew to stand firm not only against what he calls the principalities, but the way it is focused on those who, uh, who oppose differences of looking at different possibilities, but against truly not wanting to hear the word of God. To stand firm, to seek those virtues that encourage all of us when we see them, when someone stands up to tell the truth, or to be serious about righteousness, seeking opportunities to proclaim the gospel of peace, exercising our faith like a muscle that needs to be reflexed and to be reminded of its strength, knowing God's salvation in Christ personally as we've experienced him, and calling upon that spirit, the word of God, in prayer to place ourselves before the Lord to breathe, to slow down. We are with Christ. And to pray at all times, being alert and aware of the community of saints that surrounds us, not only at this altar when we celebrate communion of saints from all times and all places that celebrate the goodness of the Lord, of the God who we know is from all eternity, our parents, our grandparents, teachers who pray for us eternally and pray and proclaim the gospel, both lay and ordained, that that gospel is boldly proclaimed. Prayer. Do we do it by rote or by attention? It's easy to fall into that one rather than to say, I am placing myself before the living Lord who sits beside me, who hears my prayers and knows my heart's heart's desires. What relationship is not enhanced by paying attention to what is said? Years ago, Jason's um, office building and the floor that he was on also had a hearing center. He was curious because he passed that door every day as to just what they did and so stopped by and said hello. 
And when he left, he had something called a marriage card. And it was for basically to develop listening skills. And some of the suggestions were these. Don't begin a sentence with your head in the refrigerator. Truly, how many conversations at home begin when you open the refrigerator door and you're talking to someone else, but you're talking into the refrigerator? Or you begin a sentence and we walk out the door as we're uttering it, not in the direction of the person, but as we, as we go down the hall. Attention is important. Eye-to-eye -eye contact. Don't continue to talk and leave the room. Get the other person's attention first. And of course, Christ's attention is on us. And what has been our experience like Simon Peter? We have come to believe that you are the Holy One of God. Have we experienced that indwelling of Jesus through the Spirit in times of loss and disappointment, the peaks of joy, those things that we can recall when we had to make a decision about whether to move a family halfway across the United States or even how to renegotiate life when the way we've been living it is no longer working. And that abiding, trusting, listening, questioning with Jesus when Jesus is our rock, our Savior. By remembering these times in our lives, we know the power of God in Christ and it strengthens our own bonds with him to be able to proclaim him in this world. When it is asked, will God indeed dwell on this earth? Even in heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, O Lord, much less this house that I have built. The answer is yes. In heaven let you abide, on earth let you abide, and in my heart and yours. Amen.